haven't seen that before. Do you know what that means? Oh, what's that? Scheduled call being connected. No? Hmm. Yeah, no, I know. Okay. I don't know what that is. Should I hit send content right at this moment? Oh, that's it's six, it's past six fifty. That's right. Okay, so we're sending content. We'll see if it changes. Okay, so recording is on the left side of the screen hey. now. The screen the left side is yeah, right. I know. Get right at all so out. Is this yeah. the point where I put screen layouts? Make your work for your coffee. Yeah. Yep. Which isn't here. Gotcha. Yet. And full screens, right? Can't remember that. And then now it says call meetings presentation. Oh wait a minute. Okay. You know what? I think because it was sort of hazy and it was over menu, so I'm gonna hit see if I can get back the screen layout. How do I? Hit? Okay, this is a dumb question, but how can I hit full screen without hitting the Good morning. How are you? Good. Oh, you had a nice oh, launch vacation okay. last yeah. month. Yeah, I did. Too. How was it? Maybe the best trip I ever did. Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah, have you done watch you pick yet? I haven't. No. And, and in Bach, just so the two together. Yeah. And there were ten of us. That, there's, you know, uh, a lot more fun. We had like a private tour because there were ten of us in a group, so they kind of bunched us all together. Sure, sure. So we did everything together, and it was just, uh, we had perfect weather, which is the risk of the rainy season. Sure. So it turned out, and it's actually the most beautiful day the rats because they're all in bush and the age related stuff. Yeah, rivers just are just in yeah. yeah. trouble. So we're attacking her. However, Cusco is almost 12,000 feet, so there's a little bit of a problem with your shoes. You don't need to see you take anything in it. Well, what works best for me is the only time I really have problems is sleep. Sleeping. Okay. Cure? No sleeping. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 I didn't take I'm it. Gonna, well, you were traveling? Yeah, well, you know, pre school, as you know, it's 12,000 feet, so you get to try out sleep issues. So, so are you in Cabo or what? I had a headache. Oh, uh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> I had a problem sleeping, but I, I was just saying the way to get around that, I just took sleep. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> my, my <laughs> mistake. Yeah. You wake up in the night, you can't feel like 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 you can't fe
the squat that I, um, I didn't get into mechanisms enough. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder, you know, do I do mechanisms and yeah, spare them that punishment, or do I yeah, really. keep it superficial? <laughs> Maybe I'll frighten them next time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 FC receptors yeah. and compromise yeah. it a little bit, but not. I mean, really, what? That's, they don't need to know that. They just want to know. They, they don't know that's protected. <laughs> yeah. And well, I mean, you need to know this is for the future. They get for a couple of years of us being there. I've heard about four, but guess what? More in depth. They just need some marching orders on what you do. I mean, there's a big total you can't do all the tracing on under 200, 3 years old. Oh, I love your file. Where does it come from, by the way? I don't know. Is it just from one person or a, a group that tends to promote that? Yeah, I don't know. 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 I mean, there's both kinds of spectrum. It's based like horror stories that your two-year-old's going to get. And he takes his skin to something. And on the other hand, he can't actually. The late test one year old. Um, yeah. Five or two and three year olds. I'm trying to see if I can on the right side. Yeah, I mean, obviously. And she's going to leave the mess. So then it's going to stay like. You know, there are limitations. Well, I would afraid that the baby is like four months old or arrived at skin test positive. It was really old. Afraid that child is controlled. Well, yeah, you yeah. must literally take a picture of it. <laughs> Cut off the head, you know, and just say, this looks yeah. it's pretty accurate to me. Right. Yeah, I should do that next time. So, you know, and then the kid who was sensitized to breast growth, right? Just mystifying. Has anybody worked out that next time? Yeah, I know. It's not supposed to happen, but we all know that it does. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the interesting thing is, I know Mary and I have probably yeah, 10 or 12 kids now that sort of the opposite issue that they always worry about a little bit. Okay. 
you know, with actual, obviously, blind and this is, these are these cases from our practice, and you can see how valuable, and you can also tell them the denominator is, you know, we're not doing it on everybody. Well, the numbers are behind it, too, I mean, it's a pretty subtle test. Yeah, and we need the audiovisual improvements still. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, I'm on the same thing, I haven't really pushed it yet, or some people session next week. Then the week following that is a review of the meeting, so we try and review the whole meeting in one session, so we have to be pretty efficient. Um, I'd appreciate it if you heard something interesting, maybe just plan on a five-minute presentation and just make a couple of PowerPoints. Um, then we have to get into, Joan will be back and help us uh, with that session and for the rest of the year. Um, there's no formal sign-in sheet today, we should just sign in on that yellow piece of paper. Uh, let's go ahead and get Steve started, who's got um, exercise-induced vocal cord dysfunction in adolescence, uh, and I think a lot of very interesting data, his own data, probably the biggest cohort of people of uh, anybody in the country who's been working in this area. Well, maybe, um, and uh, but I wanted to preface the, the presentation today by saying that even though I see vocal cord dysfunction, have had a, an active clinic for about 15 years dedicated just, just to suspected VCD, um, this is a, not a, a scientifically described sy syndrome. I mean, it's, it's, I think it, most, if not all, asthma specialists agree that it exists, um, but it's I won't say embarrassing how bad the data are, um, but it, it's we need to be very skeptical about broad conclusions about cause and effect, and even what the definition is, as you'll see. So, that with that disclaimer, I can basically, um, you know, tell you what I think um, uh, because the evidence base for this is is uh, a little shaky. Uh, I don't think I have conflicts of interest that are relevant to this, uh, though I did get a mini grant, which is part of the problem with this disorder. There's not much funding to be had to, to actually study it because there's no commercial attractiveness to it. Um, but the Academy was generous enough to give a grant, and I'll present the data uh, at least in preliminary form. Um, the objectives are to understand the common presentations of, and we're going to limit it today to exercise induced vocal cord dysfunction in adolescence. So this is if you will, a phenotype. Um, so it may be quite different than um, the stereotypical um, patients that you may have anecdotally uh, found in your, in your own practices. Um, another objective is to be familiar with the demographic characteristics that, that differentiate adolescent athletes uh, with VCD from those who do not have VCD. Um, then finally, understand the observed uh, exercise-induced differences in laryngeal motion among subjects with vocal cord dysfunction and exercise-induced laryngomalacia, which is a term that um, is in the literature, but it's not usually the pulmonary and allergy literature. It's more the ENT literature. But as you'll find as the talk goes on, I feel that uh, most of these cases are the same thing. Um, and it's just in the eyes of the beholder and uh, how it's described. 
So we're going to start with uh, trying to describe uh, at least a loose definition for what BCD is, um, and then talk about exercise-induced BCD in adolescence as a, in stereotypic form, which is, uh, I think, how um, the, 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 the practicing allergist usually uh, thinks of it when the stereotype sits in front of them. And what, one of my goals today is to um, confer the idea that there are many more cases than the ones that jump out at you. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll uh, get some, some insight there. And then I'll share uh, the experience I've had over the last 15 years, um, initially with the, the prior to 2004, and then the more recent data that we've actually tried to analyze with the help of Drew Ayers, Catherine Altman, and others. So, um, OK. So, oh, actually, before we get into nomenclature, let me show you a video very quickly. Um, <coughs> so, and this is actually a nine-year-old uh, soccer player who's also a swimmer, um, and this is, and she has a history of, you know, six-month history or so of exercise-induced um, shortness of breath and throat tightness, so tightness that's, and obstruction of air that's localized to her throat. Um, you might say, why'd you pick a nine-year-old if you're talking about adolescence? And the fact is, I'm just starting with video. In fact, uh, I'm just using my still camera on video mode on the screen because we can't afford the $20,000 video setup. And, um, and this patient happened last week, so we actually, it's the one, it, it illustrates the point I'd like to make. So, um, so let's start by, uh, it's gonna just show a still photograph, and we'll see, these are the vocal cords uh, along the side. This is sort of a cross-section of the uh, neck. Um, this sort of, with the eye of faith, you can see a kind of um, arc here. That's the, the interior of the cricoid cartilage. Um, the arytenoids are up on the, the angles here, and of course this is the epiglottis. The esophagus would open up back here. So that's where everything is. And uh, so let's see it in, in video. And hopefully people on the outside will be able to give me an E. Good. And an A. So you notice when they say A, phonation results in closing of the vocal cords and they vibrate like guitar strings, that, uh, which is what they're supposed to do. When you breathe, they're supposed to be open. Um, and you notice the arytenoids are very mobile as well. This is kind of the routine we go through. And incidentally, a lot of that motion you see in there, um, that's just from being nervous, uh, as you can probably imagine, and, and we certainly don't count that as paradoxical motion. Part of the initial uh, objectives in a laryngoscopy is to, is to uh, determine is there anything abnormal anatomically, and is everything moving the way it's supposed to move? Uh, like is there paralysis, is there a, you know, a, like an arthritic arytenoid or something like that, which we've seen. Um, and then eventually try to, if there's anything paradoxical, we try to reproduce it multiple times so we know it's not just that one breath. So that wasn't particularly normal. <laughs> Here it is in slow motion. So this, see, watch the arytenoids. See how they are almost touching each other there? And that's a, uh, um, part of the, the, the mystery of this is, that's been described as, as laryngomalacia um, in the um, ENT literature. It's called, and we'll go over a couple of studies in, in the chest literature as well. Um, but that's not supposed to be happening on a regular basis. And, and all of us can do that, if, if, because we can do it consciously. Um, and there's some controversy whether that's due to passive negative inspiratory, uh, passive motion in response to negative inspiratory pressure, or whether that's actually an active uh, contraction of muscles uh, in the larynx. And, and that's a, a great question, and we don't know the answer to that. Okay, so that's the end of the slow motion. And then you'll see two degrees of it, um, and then we're almost done. So the first three are sub-maximal, and that's basically normal, and that's less normal. Okay. 
and you can see she she gives a high five at the end and everything. So um, so even a nine year old can do that pretty comfortably. Even a nine year old with VCD, who many people might think, oh my God, they must be really uh, anxious or whatever, and, and they aren't necessarily. Um, all right, so let's go back to the the talk. So as I mentioned, there is confusing nomenclature in VCD. Uh, back in um, Gosh, 1842, uh, periodic occurrence of laryngeal obstruction, uh, which is a couple of authors are trying to promote as a term polo, um, uh, was described. And that you might say, well, well, those people back then, you know, that was a long time ago. What, was, what do they know? Well, I mean, probably more than a lot of people since then. Um, <laughs> you've heard of the term Munchausen Strider, uh, pseudo asthma, functional airway obstruction, which has become a has sort of connoted a craziness, like functional, hysterical, whatever. Um, uh, factitious asthma, vocal cord dysfunction, which has stuck. Uh, that was first described in New England Journal in adults uh, who had negative methicolines and um, you know, re steroid-dependent refractory asthma um, and adduction of the vocal cords when they're trying to breathe. So, um, and then in defiance, because that name has stuck and we like it because it's VCD, and, it, and it's just, I think it, it's not the right word, but it, it's very easy to remember, and people know what you mean usually. But in defiance of that, the, the ENT community, especially speech pathologists, have preferred the term paradoxical vocal fold motion, which in my opinion has, is no more accurate, um, but they you know, like to, to talk that way. Um, and then as a couple of authors more recently, a couple years ago, Christopher, who was on that original New England Journal article, and then uh, Mike Morris, neither of whom I know personally, but they, they have done some great reviews on this, largely anecdotal, but they have a lot of experience. Um, and they, they admit that this should be renamed, um, and they want to call it Polo again. I haven't gotten to myself to do that yet, because people, so I sort of still use VCD with an asterisk. Um, anyway, so that's the nomenclature. They're about... 50 other names that I could fit on that slide. So how is it defined in our specialty? Uh, well, the NHLBI guidelines in 2007 were very explicit about it, and they, they expanded on it much more than they had previously. Uh, it's distinct from asthma, may coexist with asthma. Asthma medicines don't work. Um, they talk about this variable flattening of the inspiratory flow volume loop on spirometry uh, as suggestive of BCD. And I guess I would agree with that. It's just. If you wait for that, you're never going to see it um, because it's, I won't say never, but it's, it's not very sensitive and it's certainly not specific either unless it's done with a really good technician and it happens every time they do it, you know. So um, anyway, so, it's a, so there's some good data, which I won't have time to review today, that, that is sort of says that we shouldn't be relying on that and that actually matches my anecdotal experience. Um, and then, of course, visualizing the vocal cords during an episode um, is the, the key to the diagnosis. And I don't necessarily claim that you have to do that in every patient by any means. I certainly don't um, in, in the patients. I don't refer them to myself. If I think they have it, I just talk to them about it. And if it doesn't go away, then I might say, well, let's do a scope and all of that. But, um, and then it should be considered in uh, patients <coughs> with difficult to treat atypical asthma and in elite athletes. In other words, don't worry about it if they're just a select soccer player um, <laughs> or if they're doing a pacer test and they have strider at, you know, at, at sixth grade because they'll get an F if they don't do it. I mean, so I think that's obviously I disagree with, with, with only thinking about it when, it when there's elite athletes involved. Um, but certainly if exercise-related breathlessness is unresponsive to asthma medication, we should be uh, thinking of it. Okay, so in 1996, uh, Ray Wood, who was also on that New England Journal article, and Henry Milgram, a pediatrician, a pediatric allergist at, at uh, National Jewish, came up with diagnostic criteria. Flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy, you look for the anterior adduction of the vocal cords with the posterior chink, and most of us remember that as a board question and, and all of that. Um, paradox, paradoxical motion occurs during inspiration or during both inspiratory and expiratory phases, and, and most of us agree with that. Um, and this is just Again, reviewing the normal larynx um, in a patient. Uh, this is an adult patient. And again, vocal cords, the arytenoids up here. Uh, this, these are called the area arytenoid folds. And they change during exercise, which hopefully we'll be able to see. And then uh, the epiglottis there. The, this is from chest. This is a 
the review that uh, Christopher and Morris did, um, and it, but it does illustrate the adduction of the vocal cords with this posterior opening called a chink, um, which is the classic form and, and kind of like inspiratory loops. Um, you know, this is maybe one out of 30 patients that you'll see this. So it's not, it's not, by all means not sensitive, uh, though it's pretty specific if it's in the right context. So what's laryngomalacia? I mean, that certainly the pediatricians among us uh, have seen this over and over again in infants. I haven't because I didn't do a pediatric residency, but I've read about it and I realize that it spontaneously resolves um, and is characterized by several anatomical features, one of which is the prolapse of the arytenoids, but it also involves the shortness of those folds that I showed and also uh, um, the epiglottis prolapsing as well. Now, adolescents and young adults uh, it's typically uh, uh, only involves the arytenoids um, and only seen during exercise and most often described as laryngomalacia in the ENT literature. Um, and mainly in the 80s or so when the VCD literature was getting started in parallel kind of, and, and the two literatures were kind of ignorant of each other at the time. And these are two um, articles from our literature, um, the first of which was uh, John Weiler and colleagues in, in um, Iowa. And as you can see, this is a, an adolescent uh, that they that were able to reproduce it on a stationary bike. And you can see the retinoids look just like the, the nine-year-old we just saw. Um, um, and, and then another one that was a series, which I'll come back to later, um, it, that, that was also, I think, five or six patients with it. See, yeah. is the normal function of the arytenoids just part of the sealing off of the airway, or what does it do normally? Yeah, so the, the function of the arytenoids, I think, is, is to help establish the larynx as a platform. Because remember, part of what the larynx does is, is facilitate swallowing. So the epiglottis has something to lay on, and then the food goes over it and down the esophagus. So I think it's, it's not just breathing, though it's certainly... The, the, the cords can close with the arytenoids staying wide open, but the arytenoids can also add up completely, and like if you were squirt acid in there, the whole thing contracts. Um, so there's a reflex spasm that can happen with the arytenoids and the vocal cords. And, and I was amazed when I tried to sit down and read the primary uh, uh, articles on uh, how they looked at the anatomy and like during in normals and during exercise and things. And it's clear that they don't really know which muscles are getting stimulated when. They know what muscles are there and what they can do, but in terms of which muscles are being are contracting based on input from the brain versus a reflux, and which are just passively being allowing it to adduct based on negative negative pressures isn't really known. So it's a great question, and, and I, I was a, uh, in, impressed by how little is is still known about about that, that area. Um, anyway, in a, in a summary of the uh, cases as of 2010, Morris and Christopher um, <laughs> looked at a lot of cases. So there's, I mean, there's like a thousand cases or so. Um, and this is a, a, a nice sort of um, overview of how VCD has been described over the years, um, or POLO as they, as they call it. So it's, it's lumped together all the likely similar overlapping cases, mostly female, but not exclusively. <laughs> Um, the younger ones are a great major subgroup and are uh, predominantly in, with exercise. And then there's psychiatric factors that are often a uh, predominant uh, feature in, in at least some of the... In, in this case, if you look at 1,000, well, this is, this is basically a third of them or less. Um, acid reflux and irritants, which I've seen in the occupational arena, you know, for occupational claims for, for asthma, where it ends up being BCD and it's brought on by co-workers perfume or whatever, um, and of course, upper respiratory infections. So, and and it, it's not one or the other, there's a lot of overlap with these, just like with physical urticaria or something, where, where you know, there are certain people that seem to be more uh, at risk. And this has sort of led to the sort of model of the irritable larynx syndrome. And again, uh, not really scientifically put forth, but something that we try to um, think about um, when we're seeing the larynx doing weird things, especially if it's affecting the patient's quality of life. So exercise, anxiety, irritants, post-nasal drip, um, reflux um, in a susceptible, either contributing to irritability or causing an irritable larynx to, uh, to uh, 
misbehave during breathing. Are there any double-blind placebo-controlled trials of using acid reflux treatment to uh, incriminate that this really is irritation from acid reflux? All right, so for those that aren't in the room, the, the, the question is about uh, double-blind placebo-controlled um, trials with acid reflux for uh, improving uh, acid reflux treatment, improving BCD symptoms. There's no double-blind placebo-controlled trials of anything with this disorder, as far as I know. There's a couple of pseudo-controlled trials that I didn't believe, one of which was, uh, um, it, it, was one, it was for speech therapy, the, the main one, and I think most of us agree that speech therapy helps, but it really wasn't a very well-designed study. And the, the reflux is mainly, <laughs> the implication of reflux is mainly subjective description of the fine, you know, the, the larynx um, changes. And as you well know, that's not, doesn't withhold the scrutiny of, of Cochrane criteria, or Co Cochrane reviews, let alone, you know, anecdotal experience these days. So even though I believe reflux is important in some patients, I try to be careful not to, to uh, blame it for everything or, or treat uh, indefinitely in patients. Uh, but there are definitely some patients that anecdotally death, uh, get better and get and then in, relapse when you stop it. And, and so then that becomes an issue. Um, but it's a good question. Steve? Yeah. Any, any speculation why it's so much more common in girls? Yeah, I mean, great question about why it's a female predominance. Well, it turns out in the in the adolescent group, it's about two thirds, so it's not like ninety percent. the The forty five year old, you know, with major psychiatric history that was that, that they're like ninety five percent female. Okay, but the the adolescents, it's only about two thirds. Um, and there's been some speculation about the effects of estrogen on the that the development of that part of the anatomy, and maybe. Um, it can't withstand the negative pressures of intense exercise as well as the male. Um, though, again, that's speculation, and it's certainly interesting. Um, there's some limited longitudinal data that says that it gets better on its own within 10 years. But it, again, who knows who those, who, why patients may have altered what they did or, or, or whatever, or you know, they just don't find themselves competing anymore. All right, so let's proceed along with the... Uh, uh, stereotype. Um, so these are the early VCD, exercise induced VCD um, papers. This one was a, a fellow that I that I was uh, cohort with in in um, fellowship. I wasn't involved in this, but he was on the pediatric fellowship. And Henry Milgram is uh, the the senior author. But anyway, these are I think what seven patients, um, typically adolescent, uh, variety of different sports. Um, the last two columns talk about psychiatric diagnoses and academic treat, achievement. So, again, in the, in the um, patients referred to National Jewish with refractory exercise-induced uh, symptoms, um, they were generally psychiatrically impaired. As you may know, patients referred to National Jewish are generally psychiatrically impaired, period. Um, I mean, I've trained there, I know, and, and the, the controlled studies looking at asthma uh, with asthma controls the, the, the prevalence of, of, of psychiatric diagnoses is just as high in the, in the pure asthma patients. It's a chronic disease, and, it's, and, it, and I think there's an adaptation to that. And I would further say that in adolescence, we've got to be careful how we define what a psychiatric impairment is. They're naturally different um, at that time of life, in my opinion. So anyway, but this was, this was an important study. This was an important study, I think, in a very negative way, at least that's my bias. This is Regis McFadden's study, that, and it was in a major pulmonary journal, obviously, the Blue Journal, um, in 1996, sort of almost the same time that the uh, Milgram study came out. And these um, seven elite athletes with psychogenic vocal cord dysfunction. So, I mean, absolutely slam dunk, cause effect, psychogenic vocal cord dysfunction, um, the way it was presented and accepted for publication. Uh, five of them were adolescents, so there were a couple that were, that were young adults as well. Described dyspnea, chest tightness, choking during exercise, and they did laryngoscopy in some patients. In other words, I mean, they really, weren't really sure it was the vocal cords, and in retrospect, I would suggest that it may not be in, in, in some of the patients, or may not have been. Um, and they, the main criteria, and this is how, how it got onto the national guidelines, was 
the inspiratory truncation of the flow volume loop. Um, so, and then these are some of the uh, verbatim uh, discussion. All were highly competitive, success-oriented, and either personally intolerant of failure or were the offsprings of parents <laughs> so inclined. Um, that, was, that was me, okay, in high school. Um, the younger patients had recently entered into a new level of, level of competition where the skills of their opponents were consistently greater than those they had previously faced. Um, because there were no other uh, conditions that can produce these changes on a flow volume curve, endoscopy is not necessary to establish the diagnosis. And then finally, the clinical impression of a functional disorder was confirmed by bronchoprovocations that demonstrated variable extrathoracic airway obstruction. So, so this was a landmark study that I think, in retrospect, overstepped its bounds. I, I liken it to when I was uh, pre-med, which is actually after college. I wasn't pre-med in college, but I, when I started you know, hanging around uh, a local college and taking courses to get ready to apply to medical school. And, and the AIDS epidemic was just, they hadn't even called it AIDS yet. They weren't really sure what to call it. This was in the mid 80s. Well, that was the dogma at that time. It was only homosexual men. And on average, they'd had 50 sexual contacts in the previous 30 days. So, so again, it has nothing to do with VCD. But the analogy here is what you see out of left field when it hits you in the face is d maybe much different than how it's affecting the population or how it will affect the population. And so I would say that um, some of the stereotypes of those early VCD reports were what we would call now low-hanging fruit when it comes to uh, uh, staring at it. We need to be more careful about, about considering it in, in patients who don't fit those stereotypes. Okay, well, let's change direction to the uh, arytenoid um, phenotype. And this is that uh, Fahi study from Yale that was in 2005. Um, again, crew, soccer, swimming, um, they don't really talk about psychiatric factors at all. Um, and the generally healthy uh, non-obese, uh, and these were all female, I believe. Then there was a study, an interesting study in, from Europe, where they put a running treadmill and this contraption uh, suspended above the patient that held onto a uh, scope that was in, so continuously in their, uh, visualizing their larynx while running, um, which is a, a pretty hairy proposition. Um, I, I'd sort of waiting for more of a Bluetooth, you know, little string you can put in there and let them run that way. I think that would be a lot better. But, but it was a very interesting result. So it's a little busy of a slide, but they had four cases and 12 controls, which was a, a you know, they need to deserve some credit with this. And these cases had um, female athletes with exercise-induced strider as their history that didn't respond to asthma medicines. Um, and so with moderate exercise, uh, the arytenoids were in one of the patients started to uh, adduct um, uh, or seemed to move paradoxically. The courts didn't. With maximal exercise, all four had moderate paradoxical motion of the arytenoids, um, and uh, two of them had uh, okay. only mild vocal cord adduction, and uh, other, the other two had more, more uh, impressive VCD. Um, so it sort of shows a continuum. Um, and it, uh, an important thing to note, which will um, come back to with what Drew and I found. Um, with maximal episode, uh, exercise, there was a retinoid motion in um, looks like about a, out of six, a third of them had, had paradoxical motion, even though they had no symptoms. Um, and again, some of it's subjective, and there's a, not really a, a accepted criteria for what's normal, um, other than it shouldn't be closing when you're breathing um, under any circumstances unless there's uh, some obnoxious stimulus. All right, so let's quickly go through uh, our early data. Um, this was from OHSU when I was there. Uh, and I just sort of divided it into older and younger. The uh, depression anxiety was less common in the younger <coughs> group and, and more the rule in the older group. Um, other, like sexual abuse, which is in the literature, is more of the relevant as an association in the older category. Exercise was predominantly the younger uh, group. This is the uh, earlier Seattle series I think we put together in 2004, 2005. But, and the, the red is the uh, females, the uh, gray is, or, or blue, purple or whatever, is, depending on which <laughs> version you're seeing, is um, males. And you can see in the adolescent group, it's 
predominantly female, but there's more of a, a bigger proportion of males in, in that age group. Um, almost all had uh, some kind of asthma treatment at the time they presented to me. And, and I recognize there's a significant bias since most patients are at, or most referrers are asthma specialists. Though I also get quite a few from enlightened primary care doctors these days. Um, and in a sort of very loose way, um, looking at concurrent clinical asthma was about a third of the patients. Um, you know, several I thought had paradoxical motion even at their baseline laryngoscopy. Um, and it was like a third that had vocal cords only and a third with arytenoids only and then a third roughly with, that involved both at the time. Um, and it, here's an important one as well. 9% were elite athletes um, and about half were recreational athletes. And we've gotten some better data for recently. Um, and in general, they were good students, um, but uh, you know, a good 20% were 3.0 or below, or, or below 3.5 grade point average, put it that way. Um, so it's not only um, people with uh, high academic achievement. Steve, Steve uh, yeah. what, what do you use to uh, define concomitant asthma? This is confusing. Do they have to have a positive methacholine? Uh, no, no. They don't have uh, methacholines. Remember, this is all um, retrospective clinic data, so I wasn't thinking study while seeing the patients. It's, it's okay. They were referred by an asthma specialist. I'm an asthma specialist. We've got all this spirometry data, clinical data, and it's a clinical diagnosis at the end. Um, so typically, if they have really obvious VCD, yet they've had um, um, recurrent, uh, like severe hay fever and wheezing responsive, you know, a second type of symptom with chest tightness, wheezing responsive to albuterol and prevented by inhaled steroids, I would say yes. Um, on my clinical di clinical asthma diagnosis, and that's one of the the criteria in our database for it. So, so it's not a, a consistently or um, uh, systematically uh, qualified impression. But also, if I didn't think they had asthma, but yet they developed uh, exercise induced um, fall in their FEV1 that did not clear on its own after 10 minutes, and then did respond after bronchodilator, I would call that. Uh, asthma as well, regardless of whether they have BCD. Um, cause, but anyway, it's a great question. And this is psychiatric disturbance. I, I distinctly remember first presenting this in 2006, this slide, um, because I said that, because we had just adopted EMR in our practice, and I said, you know, this is a better psychiatric profile than my partners right now um, in terms of anxiety and depression and things like that, because we were sort of uniformly not, not doing well at the time. But, um, but the point is that about three quarters of the patients, at least by my sort of systematic but not, um, you know, intensive uh, um, questioning, uh, had, had really no clear evidence of psychopathology. Concurrent GERD reported heartburn, which I try to restrict to these days rather than being biased by the laryngoscopy for, uh, findings, a good third of them. Um, so then, but before Gary starts talking, Let's, uh, <laughs> let's I'll, I'll say, hold it till we do the, right. the control trial, the control study. Um, so the summary of the uh, early experience was, you know, let's, I was already concerned about stereotypes, obviously, if you've heard me talk about it before, um, and um, a large minority had symptomatic reflux, so um, for whatever that's worth. All right, well, let's talk about the more recent data, which is hopefully more interesting. Um, Pediatric exercise induced, sorry, um, BCD. That, so we don't have that typo on the actual paper. It hasn't been submitted yet, uh, though it's in preparation. We're waiting on the third author, who's the statistician. But uh, so Drew's been really helpful, and Catherine Altman was helpful at transcribing the database and, and helping uh, look at things. Um, it's a retrospective chart review, all subjects under age 21, uh, seen in RBCD clinic. Uh, for suspected exercise-induced BCD, um, who also, during their visit, had their s symptoms successfully reproduced during free-running exercise challenge. So if I thought they still had it, but we didn't really have a good study that day, because well, then I mean, we didn't include them. Or if they had vocal cord adduction, but they didn't have the same symptoms, they didn't count. But this is like reproduced why they came there. Um, and then also had uh, paradoxical motion documented during the <coughs> We divided them into two groups, 
uh, VCD, which is the, where we actually saw the vocal cords adducting at some uh, abnormal degree, with or without a retinoid motion, or laryngomalacia. Um, originally, we were going to just call this paradoxical retinoid motion, but I thought it would be more provocative to call it laryngomalacia, since that's what the ENTs tend to call this, um, and, uh, and then see what people think. Anyway, so, um, and this is our protocol in clinic that has been repeated uh, several hundred times over the past 15 years. Um, generally start with a spirometry baseline laryngoscopy after doing this really long questionnaire and interview. Um, and then warm them up with a minute and a half of jogging or so, um, which incidentally, the average heart rate of normals or VCD patients in adolescent who, who is like 165 beats per minute after jogging for a minute and a half, which astounds me every time it happens because I would be, it takes me about 25 minutes to get that high and I'm ready to stop, you know, when it gets that high. So it's an interesting difference in, in age. Anyway, after a three quarter speed, 30 meter sprint uh, with about three to five seconds rest in between, um, we do that six times as a continued warm up, but keeping their heart rate up. And then running lines, which you may be familiar with, sort of back and forth, increasing distances as fast as they possibly can. And it's emotionally stressful because you have to stop without falling down and those people watching and everything. So it's, a, it's, a, it's no athlete's favorite training exercise, but a lot of them are forced to do it. And, so, and it's easy to do in a small area. Um, and then query symptoms after each set of lines. Describe what they feel. Is it more <coughs> inspiration, expiration? Um, chest, throat, tingling of the numb of the lips or fingers or whatever. I mean, there's other, other things we see sometimes. Um, and then try to uh, keep the heart rate above 80% max for um, five to eight minutes. So we have a good chance of also um, provoking asthma if they have uh, EIB as well. Um, and then repeat the laryngoscopy. And this is usually between seven and nine minutes after starting the exercise and hopefully no more than a, a minute or so after running back into the, the, the room, um, and then repeat the spirometry twice, once right after the laryngoscopy, and then again tw uh, 10 minutes after that. Um, and obviously with EIB, it should be sustained, because without treatment, that would typically last close to an hour, um, let alone, uh, and may not peak until 20 minutes after the start of exercise. So, so that's kind of how we do it, and how we've do, been doing it for a long time. And, um, and this is, these are the results. So the, there were a few statistical, <coughs> statistically significant, but the may or may not be clinically meaningful differences. The age of diagnosis among the patients with the vocal cord involvement versus laryngomalacia uh, was about a, a little less than a year older, but it was technically significant. The body mass index was a little higher um, in the VCD group. Again, I'm not sure what that means, but, it, but I feel obligated to, to share it. Um, the grade level percentage was different, but that's probably a manifestation of the age difference. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's similarity throughout all of these categories. The grade point averages were slightly different. Um, you know, the slackers in, with laryngomalacia were 3.5 average grade point, uh, whereas the VCD was 3.72. But the average was not 4.0, obviously, in any, either category. Um, and that was a, a significant difference. Um, the nature of symptoms were basically um, at least the very predominant chest discomfort. So as many people, uh, or almost as many described chest discomfort as described throat discomfort. And obviously most of them, it was both. Um, but some it's just chest discomfort. And you know that's very, very important. Um, so it's not always localized to the throat. Um, and very few described choking, which was the predominant symptom in McFadden's paper. Um, cough was occasional, um, and as you can see, the strider was a very common or a common finding uh, when we did the, the challenge. Um, that's often transient, and by the time we get the scope in, when we get back to the room, the strider is often not happening anymore. It depends on the, on the patient. Um, now, here's one thing for Gary also, but he's, I will ask him not to comment further, about uh, 25 23 to 25 percent of both groups uh, said they, when asked if they get a burning sensation behind their the breastbone in the middle, which is one of the questions on standardized questionnaires for reflux, 
they, they would say yes, and, and many of would take occasional tums and things like that. So, you know, a fair number compared to what I would have thought an adolescent who's not obese would, would have um, responded. Do you have a control population? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I say to hold your tongue. Um, all right, associated history, they're very atopic. Now, immediately the, the, the knee jerk is, well, that's because the allergist referred them to you. And that's probably right, but you never know. When, when I presented this data in Virginia, not this data, but the previous data in Virginia of five or six years ago, Tom Platzmills went on and on about this potentially being um, a, affected by allergy. And, and it's like, really? <laughs> and I, I just sort of wrote it off because he says a lot of stuff like that. But, um, and, and some of it ends up being true. So I think and, uh, we need to keep that in mind. And then we'll, we'll look at the, the uh, um, controls as well in a minute. Um, clinical asthma is about one out of four, one out of five. Um, and uh, the ADHD, ADD, there were more, significantly more in the laryngomalacia group. Um, but otherwise, psychiatrically, there wasn't a distinction. Um, and then other factors that really no differences between the, the meds they were on or other cofactors in addition to exercise that seem to aggravate symptoms. And oops, in the spirometry, oops, I will say uh, basically normal. <laughs> and, uh, and the FEV, let's see, oh, I don't have that on here. The, uh, oh, yeah, FEV. FEF50, FIF50, which is the ratio of the mid-inspiratory flow on inspiration and expiration, or expiration over inspiration, um, was slightly over one, but not truncated like it would be on a flow volume loop that you, you see on a, on a board exam for, for BCD, or you, was implied by the national guidelines. So they, they generally don't have baseline um, or even post-exercise truncation of the flow volume loop. So very few differences between groups, and unclear if clinically significant, but there are some both uh, uh, statistically significant and trend uh, differences that need to be followed up on. Um, but let's quickly get to the, uh, uh, well, let's actually, the, in the broader picture, I'll say that that data also, um, I think there's several comments. One is laryngomalacia is seen more common, more often than pure VCD based on at least in our Seattle experience. Um, and there's no one historical feature that accurately predicts one versus the other, though there may be some statistical differences. Um, psychiatric disturbance is uncommon. Um, most patients are good students, but not 4.0 students. Uh, most um, patients are not elite athletes, though, in fact, non-elite, non-athletic, which was one of the categories, was as common as a true elite athlete, which I defined as you know, pre-Olympic or even a premier player, which isn't that elite, but it's, it is still much more selective and, and hard to get. It's like two stages of, uh, you know, surviving uh, tryouts or whatever to get there. Um, and then reported history of heartburn is, is relatively common. <coughs> yeah. So let, does anybody have some tongues for Gary? <laughs> All right, let's go with the, the controlled study. This is the one that's Academy supported Exercise-induced laryngeal motion in female adolescent athletes, a comparison of vocal cord dysfunction with matched control. So this involved retrospective analysis of uh, patients with, who are all at the competitive level, so not the elite, not the recreational, but like select soccer or you know, high school varsity. Um, that, that's, I mean, I have criteria for how we define that. And poor Catherine Altman had to go through every single <coughs> EMR chart um, and collect that and figure it out and then ask me if there were differences so for like 200 patients or something. And then, and then, we, then, then we threw some out that didn't actually need it. But anyway, so they all had paradoxical vocal cord motion confirmed during symptoms post-exercise. So we took the ones in our database that met those, and, and those were in the database I just showed you before, and the ones that met that competitive level, the age 13 to 17, all were female by just just decided to keep it to females, um, and that all had vocal cords involved. And then we did random selection, so we had 20 of those cases to, to compare with the controls. Um, and that was, the controls were a prospective recruitment of, basically, a friend of mine's the president of Crossfire Soccer on the east side, and, and he was willing to like ask his coaches in his leagues to, to uh, 
you know, see if any of the girls wanted to, to come in and get studied. So, and we paid them $100. So they were, they were over right before Christmas break, we, Drew and I did um, 20 patients um, and, and did the whole thing with like, you know, the same questionnaire, the same physical exam, same, and, and anxiety, depression, psychological trauma, heartburn, all those things were asked in exactly the same way that we do in clinic. Um, and actually, I insisted that I do all that questioning because of, uh, I didn't want um, to, to, to change it. Uh, any way we could. Anyway, so, um, and then we threw out two. One, because she said she, one of the exclusion criteria was having exercise induced dyspnea or chest tightness or a history of asthma, uh, at least since age five. And she clearly, after running uh, for five minutes, you know, was having wheezing and expiratory, uh, and chest tightness and expiratory. Obstruction and I, and then she had by the way baseline obstruction on her spirometry and I said well do you ever get this he goes yeah I get this all the time I said but I thought you said that no when we interviewed you and she said well I thought that was normal I go no you know here's an inhaler go talk to call the doctor so, so we threw that one out um, and uh, anyway so and this is it so we ended up with 18 controls and 20 in the VCD and. Notice the GPAs are the same, pretty much the same, 3.7. Um, history of anxiety, pretty much the same. Depression, same. Psychiatric tra or psychological trauma, like witnessing some gruesome event or being a victim of abuse in some way, um, is was really not there. Um, the ADHD, ADD thing was not there. So these were not Ringo Malaysia patients. These were BCD and, um, that we picked. Uh, reported history of atopy, uh, very prominent in BCD, which we'd expect, and zero of the controls we brought in. So there's, there's clearly a difference there um, that could easily be referral bias. Reported history of heartburn, Gary. Um, three of the 18 was yes. So it was, you know, and I don't know if that's just intensely exercising abdominal pressure kids get heartburn more often than other kids or whether it's the wrong question to ask. Um, I don't know, but it was not statistically different from the VCD patients, which I think will please you. And then the paradoxical motion post-exercise, most striking thing of all was eight of them, of the normals, had, it was all uh, arytenoid, but it was definitely, remember, we, it's intense running, and nobody's really studied patients that were normal after running this intense. They're usually on a bicycle. And that doesn't work, or a treadmill, which doesn't typically work. So, so they definitely have to be careful about, um, you know, asymptomatic patients. But the um, so that was interesting. And then the other only other difference was the baseline spirometry was higher in the BCD patients, which is interesting. Um, neither one was obstructed, and neither one changed uh, during exercise in a way that was significant. Um, certainly, that, that that remained significant after repeating it ten minutes later. Um, so I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, I would hope that first time people on spirometry, um, which is what the controls were, that most, most of them had never had it. In fact, I'm not sure anyone had, had ever done spirometry before. But I would hope it would be more accurate than, than you know, 8% off uh, just because they weren't used to it. Especially if we're, and this was a COCO spirometer with one of our nurses that's one of the best ones we have for, for, for performing spirometry. Um, all right, so conclusions. Exercise-induced BCD in competitive female athletes uh, have higher FEB1 and FEC um, in our group, though this may be a technical issue, I don't know. More often a topic, maybe referral bias, bias but should be looked at. Um, no difference in GPA, psychiatric disturbance, or reflux. Very consistent observation in our clinic over the past decade. So um, competitive female athletes without symptoms, a uh, large subset have mild laryngomalacia immediately following intense sprinting. So that was an unexpected finding that I think is real um, and uh, will hopefully be useful to people uh, when it gets published. So what, what's next? Um, so I'll call it POLO. <laughs> well, there's some unanswered question. Does defining laryngomalacia versus VCD have any meaning? I don't know, um, at least in this age group. Um, and is it a continuum of the same syndrome? I think so, 
And one thing I didn't talk about, but would be a good prospective study is the patients start feeling discomfort well before there's any airflow obstruction. So, so I know we think of it as an obstructive disease, but I, in my opinion, this is anecdotal based on experience, is, is that the discomfort is largely, presumably, muscles contracting somewhere in an isometric fashion that, that is very uncomfortable. Um, they feel it in their chest, they feel it in their throat, and it's just a horrible feeling, but it's not airflow obstruction from top to bottom. Um, airflow obstruction becomes part of it, and that may feed into maybe panic, maybe that's why the vocal cords end up contracting, I don't know, but it's a, it's a very interesting thing that needs to be discussed, and it's out of the box. This is not accepted dogma, but I, I think it's true and something that needs to be looked at. Is there any component of hyperventilation that you find? In some patients, there absolutely is. And tingling and alkalosis? And... Uh, not very common, but, the, but you know, maybe one out of 20 patients absolutely has that. The, fortunately, some of the treatment is the same, so getting the patients to breathe more slowly and, and relax the breathing is, a, is often effective. And, um, so, but, but technically, I think most people agree that hyperventilation is a form of anxiety, um, and uh, so that needs to be worked out. Um, so do, you yes. ever, do you ever see this in swimmers, elite swimmers? Yes. Yeah. So that does that. Uh, that uh, video I showed of the nine-year-old, she was also a swimmer. Um, but, so it's, swimming doesn't isn't protective. You might think, well, warm, moist air might be less apt to irritate the larynx or whatever, or um, but there's also breath holding, and there, it's a very complicated. Well, thing. I know. I mean, that may some in some. I would think perhaps be protective. Yeah. No, I would have thought so too. But we've definitely had um, uh, proportionally as many swimmers I w as I would have expected, I mean, given that swimming isn't nearly as common as soccer uh, in terms of numbers of kids doing it um, in Seattle. Just for fun, has anyone looked at like these people inhaling hypertonic saline at normal flow rates and see if you can induce? Oh, oh, great, great question. So the question is like a surrogate for exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I have got all kinds of ideas. Mannitol. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were in the in the phase three studies for the mannitol provocation um, approval, and uh, one of the patients had Frank Strider right before our eyes. So. I don't know if that was fair to the patient because I didn't. And it, they weren't, it wasn't my patient. I didn't see him again. But, mm -hmm. but they were something upper airway was going on during that. And uh, and I, by the way, I don't um, use mannitol because uh, I feel like it doesn't really help me with with <coughs> asthma compared to the tools we already have. But but that one needs to be looked at. They were going to fund a, an investigator initiated study, and then they didn't have. I think they, they're not making much money. Get another grant. Yeah, I need a grant for that. There's also. Rich Rosenthal, many of you may have known that name. He sort of did the dosimeter. Uh, he's kind of, you know, used to be at Johns Hopkins, but he's kind of private and, and inventor type of guy. Um, he has this thing called a hyperventilometer, <laughs> which is a, a scuba mouthpiece that's adapted to a laptop with gas, CO2 and stuff. So it's basically reproducing uh, eucabinic uh, hyper... Or wait, EV, EVH, uh, and, and um, so it's like the most sensitive exercise-induced asthma surrogate, um, but now in a potentially practical way, because most places, if you want EVH testing, it takes up a whole room, and, um, and that's, you know, you know, we can't really do that. So he's, but he doesn't have any funding, and, and it hasn't gotten approved, but he had a, a poster at the Academy a while back. So EVH would be a good surrogate. And then it's attractive to me because I could have the scope in the whole time while they're just sitting here breathing hard, um, which would be nice. Al Marati, who's the laryngologist here at the university, is um, not an asthma guy, obviously, but he has them. He says he can completely reproduce it by having them hyperventilate in front of them. And I, as you can see in the video, have them do that too. But I, I definitely have different findings with the exercise in many of them. So. Um, it's certainly not as sensitive to just sit there and hyperventilate room air, uh, but it's a good question. Steve Hart, they typed in a question, and I had the same thought, something like this. Is there a better name for a retinoid adduction than laryngeal malaysia, which implies like a permanent anatomic abnormality? Like right, that's a great question. And, and I, I admittedly use laryngeal malaysia to be provocative because I think it needs to get people's attention. 
Um, it's, it's not a good name. It's not, you know, totally floppy larynx. Um, Christopher and uh, Morris have proposed, um, I forget what they call, but I'll, I'll tell Art I'll get on the reference. Um, he needs to re read their review from 2010. It's very detailed. It has different potential names. The thing is, we need a, a catchy name to keep people's interest, too. Um, polo is kind of, makes me think about holding my breath in a swimming pool and, and, and yelling Marco and then going underneath again. It's a little different. But, um, it, but it's still, I think it's, it's, it's hard to get, we're not better than that. And even though that was, you know, 100 150 years old, um, that, that term. And then we still actually don't know if speech therapy works. I think it does. Um, and, but again, that's anecdotal. The, the literature isn't very good on it. There's only one controlled study. And I didn't think the methods were very good. It's, it's certainly not blinded. Um, do, you, do you see your patients back after they've had several months? Of yeah, so, so the, the follow-up that I do routinely, realizing that if I'm starting them on reflux treatment, I may be treating something that doesn't mean anything is I, I want them to see either me or my partner who may have preferred them to me within two months to determine are they better. Um, do, you know, if, there's on, if they're on medication, is it time to stop the medication? Um, and uh, do they need <laughs> psychotherapy or you know, a, a, a more of a, a psychiatric workup as well? But some of them you know, are sort of the ones that have anxiety that's well, and well known, they may even be on medication for it. That may still be the underlying, you know, main untreated part of it. So, do you have um, a sense of the numbers and how many seem to be better after speech? Um, I'd now? say three quarters. It's definitely disappointing compared to, you know, how many get better with asthma on prednisone. I mean, it's not as reliable as that. It's part of it is most, it's most it's drugs. a point of is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there's definitely. I mean, like you might if you want to ask how many have zero symptoms after speech therapy, it may be ten percent. But it's sort of like remember that uh, movie called The Perfect Mind, where the guy was schizophrenic and and it had me fooled the first half. I thought the person was a real person, and, and but when he's under treat, when he's medicated and doing well, his. Uh, Psychosis didn't disappear. It's just smaller and it's further away. It's just watching. And I kind of feel like that's what happens with, B with BCD, that it's still, for the most patients, still there, but they don't let it bother. It doesn't alter their performance. Um, they've just adapted to it, and, and uh, the behavioral modification, I think, helps them yeah. contract or avoid unnecessary contraction of muscles in the larynx that, that we, cause we that We need discomfort. to give Gary a minute or two here. He alluded <laughs> no, no, to no. his opinion. Well, I, I have the opinion that a lot of it is just uh, uh, paradoxical contraction of upper airway muscles, and it's kind of a continuum from a globus sensation all right. the way to the, where you get a chink, which is I four plus, and the majority of people don't have that. And I wonder if just people looking at the people with globus sensation might find some of the same thing as paradoxical motion of rhythm. That'd be points. great. That's a great question. Like that. So I just think it's continuing. I do have a bias, as you can tell, that I think no. at least my population that I see of middle-aged women under stressful conditions with psychiatric history, that most of it's stress-related and that it's probably not acid reflux, and, and most of them have multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome, or many of them do, <laughs> and I don't think it's really direct irritation. I do have my bias on that. And the same thing on the allergy issue. Most of my patients that have it don't have allergies. And well, so remember, you're talking about 45-year-old females. A very different. So I yeah. think this is a very different population. And I think they're much more amenable to treatment. And I agree. I don't think that most of them have uh, overt psychiatric diagnosis. I do think a lot of them are pushing really hard. It doesn't surprise me that the less conditioned have it just as much. In fact, I would think that they'd have it even more being pushed and have it, hey, you're going to get an amp if you don't uh, uh, run this fast, that they would get it. But I think there is a stress component on there, either self-imposed or by outside stressors such as parents. I, I kind of agree with McFadden on a lot of it. Yeah, well, well I, yeah, but I think my point is, I mean, you can't agree with McFadden with two-thirds of the patients that I've seen. I mean, I, I think. They just haven't mattered. Well, I don't think that's a psychiatric diagnosis. Hey, the kid's pushing, he's trying to do their best. I don't think that means they have a psychiatric yeah, but, uh, Although McFadden, sure. He, he, he I think, he, he's, I think he kind of set us back a couple decades in terms of how to think about this. And I think now it's coming around. But, I mean, you've had teenagers. Oh, and I Te see teenagers are crazy people. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, that's and, true and, too. and it's normal to be crazy at that age. Yeah. Yeah, like, and especially if you can't breathe, yeah. you start to feel like you're going to die. I would panic. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So, it, so I try to give them the benefit of the doubt. But if it's if it's impaired with their their, you know, forgetting about the exercise, if they've had anxiety or depression that's altered their sleep or their ability to have friends or doing well in you know their, their academic performance or something like that, then that's that's sort of how I define it in my sort of lay person's, because I'm not a psychiatrist uh, way, but I'm hoping that we can get a, the same soccer league, if I get funding, to do a prospective like three-year thing where new team that are formed, patients that just, or athletes that have just gotten into that league, do MMPI inventory and do reflux instrument, you know, um, and and before they had it, anything, and see, well, who's got asthma, who's got anything, and then do the same thing, see, because they tend to develop it during these competitions, you know, as their competition increases, and then look at them a couple, of, two or three years later, see how it's changed, and the ones that have changed, is there a systematic difference at their baseline, and I think that would be a great study to do, it wouldn't be hard now that we have the contacts with them. Um, Steve, what do, I don't know what speech therapists do. They just teach people how to consciously control their vocal cords? Um, no, well, not exactly. That's part of it. But the speech pathologist, um, first of all, it varies a lot depending on who it is that's doing it. And I don't pretend to think one way is better than another. <laughs> the, the main factor is they need the training, the speech pathology training, because that they know how, to, how the larynx works, um, number one. And number two, they need to be motivated to help these kids that, that they have to be into it. And <coughs> beyond that, some of them, you know, tongue techniques and throat techniques and first lip breathing and all these things, others never talk about the body above the neck. They, they talk about the diaphragm and, the, and, and sort of distracting away from that part of the body. So, and I don't really have a strong bias. I do it myself with patients, you know, showing them how they're breathing and how they should try to breathe. But it becomes more of a behavior modification and I, I, and there are athletes typically, so I say it's sort of like learning how to shoot free throws. You can be shown perfect way to do it and miss 10 in a row when you first start. And a year later, you might make eight out of 10. And the difference isn't that you know better how to do it. It's just that your body just does it. And, and so that's sort of uh, the analogy I try to use for it. And they, they get that and, and hopefully they're more willing to, to stick with it. But they need to be, the patients need to be motivated. To, to unlearn it. Um, and I can tell them it's kind of like forgetting how to breathe. But anyway, so I think that's it. Just one last comment. We were talking about it when I came in here. They, we have that new journal, the, oh, the Turn Rights to the Vocal Cord article. Did you guys see it? And it's a series of two yeah. uh, patients, and they make the deduction <laughs> that vocal cord dysfunction is secondary to dampness. <laughs> they have no studies, they have no they didn't measure dampness in their environment. And it's by a reputable group, and I think we're gonna have the ramp see the ramifications of this because everybody that has dampness with BCD is now gonna inflame their environment for it. Uh, and I can't believe that the article was accepted. But of course this is clinical studies and it, there isn't gonna be the scientific rigor. But uh, I, I, I tell you, you uh, do good. In our father parent journal, Jack I I couldn't imagine that if not Because yeah. they, they are, yeah. even yeah. clinical yeah. stuff, they, they rate you over the whole. Yeah. Yeah. So. But anyway, but I, I totally agree. One but. more outside question. Can you work with inspiratory strength training? Inspiratory strength training, that's a great question. Um, I've not ever heard, you know, like a extended spirometer, like is used in a hospital, I guess. Um, I've not heard of that being used. The thing is, one of the great, one of the techniques I've seen work really well is um, visualizing, inspiring the air through your lips rather than your throat. And it actually gets the brain focused away from the, the larynx and towards the lips. And so even though you're not like uh, altering the airflow, you're just altering the focus, presumably some of the stimulation of muscles elsewhere in the wide. And, uh, you know, and there's something to do biofeedback with a scope in. Um, and like in Portland, I send patients down there. Is this the only place I know that this happens? But no, there's a, there's no one the like right way. Not in here, you know. Terribly valid. I guess we can. It's been a great time. Warmer weather, at least. All right. Thank you.